stand for the Word of God. Matthew chapter 15, verse 33 says, And the disciples said to him, Where are we to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed such a great crowd? And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven and a few small fish. Directing the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. They all ate and were satisfied. And they took up seven baskets full of broken pieces that were left over. We are in week three of our series that we call The Economics of Sacrifice. And today I'm gonna speak on just the thought, it's not equal ability, but it has to be equal intentionality. It's not equal ability, but it has to be equal intentionality. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that it's alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, able to get into our life and penetrate and bring supernatural change from the inside out. Lord, let there be a fresh touch of your presence on this service. Wrap your arms around us, Holy Spirit. Fill the room with your reality and your touch and your love and your grace. Overwhelm us, Lord God, and give us a revelation personally and as a congregation. Let there be a prophetic edge on what takes place here. And move us, Lord God, one more step into becoming just that little bit more like Jesus that we want to be like. Lord God, we don't want to leave the same way that we came in. And so we're trusting you to do something significant in our life. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Amen. You can be seated, high five the person beside you and say, you don't look like you have a terrific coma. Somebody said this, they said, the kingdom of God is not established on the, the gifts and talents of a few, but on the relentless, faithful, intentional sacrifice of many. Nothing in this room today comes to us without someone making a sacrifice. Someone sacrificed to give us this property. Someone sacrificed to build these buildings. Somebody somebody along the way has, has given, and not everyone gave the same. People gave different amounts of money to make it all happen, but the one thing that was common, it wasn't equal giving, but it was equal sacrifice. We had one couple in our church who gave sacrificially a $50,000 offering towards the seats that you sit in. They came to us and they said, we will match the giving of the church. Whatever people give, we will match that up to $50,000. And so they just held it for a while and we let the giving come in and some people gave $5 and some people gave $50 and some people purchased a seat or two. And anyway, this couple came back to us and said, where are things at? And we spoke to our accountant and they said, well, over $50,000 has come in. And so they were able to give their 50, contributing with the other, what other people gave. And so it's not equal giving, but the sacrifice is equal. And so we spoke about that, that week one in our message series, The Economics of Sacrifice, is that it's not equal giving, but it is equal sacrifice. Last week, I, I spoke about the economics of sacrifice being equal reconciliation, that, that we've been reconciled to Christ. He has forgiven us and brought us into relationship with Him. And now God expects us to be able to forgive other people and reconcile bad relationships. Forgive us our trespasses is the prayer. As what? We forgive those who trespass against us. I, 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 somebody told me this week that somebody posted on their uh, social media when they put the quote out about forgiveness. They may have used a couple of cuss words in there, but pretty much just said they're not going to forgive anybody. They're, they're, there's all a bunch of lies. They're not forgiving anybody. And that's, 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 that, that's right. That you, you, you don't really have to forgive anybody, but you do have to remember that the person that you don't forgive angers you and they probably never think about you. The thing that frustrates you the most about people 
that you won't forgive, they're not, they're, they're, you're not even, in their, not even in their thought life. But here's the reality, that when you don't forgive somebody, it's like drinking a cup of poison and expecting the other person to die. Forgiveness is not about just setting people free, it's about setting you free. That's the economics of sacrifice, is you get set free by releasing the debt that other people own you and cutting it off and moving on. We're in week three of the economics of sacrifice, and I'm gonna to talk today uh, about, it's not equal ability, but it's about equal intentionality. That we need to be equally intentional. Intentionality, begins with awareness. That's where it all begins. You're not gonna be intentional about something unless you're aware of something. Jesus had been ministering in the region of Galilee and the crowds were massive. There's about 4,000 people in this passage. Thousands of people. They've got all sorts of infirmities. He's praying for them, blind, lame, deaf, all sorts of things that are, that are happening. And so it takes a while. It's about three days that they're together on the mountain. And, and Jesus is doing this. this we, we were in, uh, Pastor Anna and I were in Israel just last year. Supposed to be there now uh, or tomorrow, actually flying out tonight to go be there tomorrow. But obviously that sort of ended. And hopefully we'll get back there one day soon. But I remember when I was in Israel for the very, very first time, I had people from our church coming up to me. And I said, Pastor John, you're just, you're just in Israel. And what was it like? Like, what did, because what did, like, everyone has God, like, has a God thought or some sort of a thought. You're in Israel and you're like, whoa, you know, get over taken by some sort of a revelation, you know. And so they're like, what, what, what revelation did, did you get? And I think the only real revelation I got was Jesus was really fit. Like, I'm wandering around, look at those mountains, and I'm thinking about this story about Jesus wandering around on the and then he goes up a mountain. I went up that mountain in that area, we, but we drove. We didn't walk up the mountain. And it was, it's a steep mountain. I'm going I'm to get into the top of the mountain, being on the top of the mountain, looking down from the mountain and realizing why Jesus fed the people on the mountain. Because he's like, I am not walking down there to get food. That was a long way. It took us a long time to get up here. The only quick way down there is to roll. That can't be great. 4,000 people rolling together. They'll end up in the lake. They're not going to pull them out. Yeah, it, it, rolling on water may have been a miracle then. I don't know how that would have worked. But, but Jesus got these people on the mountain. There's 4,000 people on the mountain. It's a very different miracle than the feeding of the 5,000, which is in all the Gospels. The feeding of the 4,000 is only in Mark and Matthew. And then it says this. It says, Jesus calls to the disciples. And this is what he says. I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I am unwilling. Everyone say unwilling. I am unwilling to send them away hungry. In other words, Jesus said, I, I, we're going to do something to meet the need. There's a need here. They, they, they've not eaten for a few days. I know there's a big crowd, but there's a need and I am unwilling to send them away, lest they faint on the way. And then Jesus said to the disciples, how many loaves do you have? Now, the disciples are still on the same page of faith as Jesus, and they, they see the challenge through their own lack. But here's the thing. Miracles don't happen through our ability. They, they happen through Jesus' ability. We can only do what we can do in the natural, but Jesus can do the supernatural. If, if it could be done with your ability, then you'd have no need to engage Jesus in the process. If it could be done in your ability, you'd need no miracle power of God. The disciples said to him, where are we to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd? And so Jesus is unwilling to send them away lacking. He says, we've got to do something about this. He says to the disciples, we've got to do something. And they, they look at the need and immediately, even though they've experienced the feeding of the 5,000, they still can't see it through the eye of faith. They're seeing it through the eye of lack. And they're like, we can't do anything here. We have nothing to feed such a great crowd of people. When you consider the need, it can be absolutely overwhelming. 
I, I, know, I know that God wants to meet need. I think most people here today would have an understanding that Jesus wants to meet needs. And, and I don't know about you, but I, I, I often get overwhelmed by the need in the world around us. We went to Ghana earlier this year and drove up to Tamale and just driving around in some of the villages up there. And you, you're just aware. And even just going on the roads on the main roads from, from city to city and you're just seeing the need on the side of the road. And, and in my mind, I'm trying to imagine what goes back, you know, the blocks off the main road. How, how bad is it back there? We're in El Salvador and, and when I was in El Salvador looking at the need that was there, I, I remember once specifically one night, uh, it was the night we had our rally that I was in worship and while I was in worship, had it been on the news about the breaking out of war in Israel-Palestine area, Palestinian area, that Gaza location, and, and how pamphlets were being dropped, and they were asking the people of Gaza to, to get out, to, to leave the city, and, you know, war's about to take place. Run, run and get out while you can. And, and, I, and I understand the, the, the good part of that. And, but as I was praying for the people in Gaza leaving and the refugees. And it, it, it hit me, like, what if that was me? What happens if, if, if today they, they, they said to Anna and I, you need to take your family to Richmond. You need to get out. Bad things are going to happen, and you need to get out. And if we didn't have a vehicle, if we didn't have a car, and we had to get to Richmond... I started to imagine me and my, my youngest daughter and her boys and Anna and, and, our, and our niece, just our family moving and walking to Richmond. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm imagining a three-year-old. Like, the, you know the three-year-old's not going to get from here to Edsel without wanting me to carry him. And then, and so now I'm carrying a three-year-old on my shoulder, in my arms, by his foot, dragging him along the ground. I, 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 I'm, I'm taking a three-year-old who will probably get to, to Backlick Road, and by the time he gets to Backlick, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And, and we just get a little further down back. I gotta go to the party, and then trying to find a party, trying to find water, trying to find food, all those things. I got it was overwhelming to me the task, and I started to pray like I, I've never prayed before for people that I do not know. But this is what the church is supposed to be about. And sometimes you can just get overwhelmed by, by, by need. We support Convoy of Hope so we can have missions touches all over the world where there's emergencies. And, and, and we've often got Convoy telling us of needs that have arisen from earthquakes or floods or fire or disaster and trying to imagine those people trying to reestablish their life in Israel right now. Bina Richardson, who has a ministry there, uh, we're trying to work out how we can help her minister to people in that area. I've been in email contact with her. There's, there's, so, much, there's so much need in our own church. People who need food, people who need money, people who need shelter, people who need work, people who need to get healed, people who need God to move in our own church family and then in our DMV community, overwhelmed sometimes by, by the need. And sometimes I think we just sit there and go, man, how, how can we possibly meet all the need? We cry out like the disciples, where, where are we to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd? Where, where are we going to get the supply to meet the need that's in our community? But nothing happens if we're not intentional. And intentionality begins with awareness. That you and I need to look beyond our own vision and our own house and our own door and our own life and look at the world around us and be aware of the need out there. We can get so consumed with our own need that we forget that there's a need all around us. Intentionality requires ability. But the thing is that the ability is not equal. Verse 34, Jesus said to them, how many loaves do you have? Everyone say, you have. Say it a bit louder and like you're alive. And we say, you have. Say it loud so the people online can hear you. You have. How many loaves do you have? They said seven and a few small fish. 
and directing the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took. They had, he took. They had seven loaves and a few fish. That was all they had. That's their ability. That's what they have in the natural. And so they say, this is all we have. And we give and give you, Jesus, what, what we have. And then Jesus took into his hands what they had. How many loaves do you have? Jesus prepares the scene for a miracle by taking what was in their hand. He took what the disciples gave to him. That's that partnership I talked about around the offering today. You move, God moves. So Jesus takes what's in their hand. What was in their hand. Jesus, Jesus didn't have it. He got it from them. He took. He didn't create it. Now, he could have created it. He could have created it because he is the creator, but he didn't create it. He took what they hand had in their hand. What do you have? We have, we have bread. He, he, didn't, he didn't call down manna from heaven to feed the people. He could have done that. God's done that before. God fed generations for years on manna from heaven. He could have called down manna. He could have spoken bread into existence. Everything that we see in creation was spoken by Jesus into existence. He spoke a whole heap of things into existence. He could have spoken some bread. He could have spoken some fish into existence to feed 4,000 people. That's not a, a, a big job when you're the creator of the world. He didn't run to the shop. He didn't borrow a donkey and ride down the hill and go and get some for them. He said, no, what have you got? What have you got in your hand? And when they looked at what they had in their hand, they came back and they said, we, we just have seven loaves of bread and a few fish. What they had in their hand felt like it was so inadequate, didn't feel like much, but it was according to their ability. God only asks you to do what you can do. He asks you to do what you can do, that you can be intentional. That's the starting point of faith. God says, we're going to start somewhere. Let's start with what you have in your hand. What do you have in your hand? What do you have on supply? There was a widow, and she was, creditors were knocking on the door, wanting to repossess everything. She was in a financially bad place. She went to the man of God. She went to Elisha, and she said, Elisha, life's tough. My husband's died. I've got no money. The creditors are, uh, are hounding. I'm, my, my, my phone's blowing up every day. What am I going to do? And, and Elisha says to her, what do you have? What do you have in your house? What's here? What do you have? And she says, well, I don't have much. Uh, all I've got is this one jar of oil. So in her ability, all she had was a jar of oil. And it wasn't enough to meet the need. The need was great, but what she had was not a lot. According to her ability, one jar of oil. Then Elisha said, go out and tell people to go and get some empty jars. And so maybe it was her children, maybe it was a friend, maybe she went out herself, and they went out and they gathered empty jars. They collected empty jars. And so again, they just had what was in their hands. They gave according to their ability. And so they borrowed from the neighbor, Sam, what are you doing, Sam? Sam said, I got a jar, thanks, Sam. Can I borrow the jar? Yes, thank you. but it's empty. That's what I need, Sam. I need an empty jar. Some people are going, can I borrow a jar? Yeah, I got a jar. What's it full of? Cookies. And so they're eating the cookies on the way back in, and they got an empty jar. They just keep bringing jars. And Elijah keeps pouring oil, and the oil kept flowing flowing as long as the jars kept coming. The supernatural miracle only happened when they matched their ability with God's ability. Now, the intentionality is exactly the same. We're going to have a miracle here. God's going to answer a prayer. But their ability was totally different. That's how God works. Jesus was at a wedding at Cana. The Bible records this as being his very, very first miracle. And so they're at the wedding and they're celebrating for days. They're having a, 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 a fun time. Everything's going great. Then all of a sudden, the Bible says that they ran out of totally non-alcoholic apple juice. I read the Assembly of God version. So they run out of totally non-alcoholic apple juice. And so the mother of Jesus, she comes to, to, to Jesus and she says, hey, Jesus, I like, yeah, mom. And, and, and she said, we have an issue. And she's like, what's the issue, mom? 
And, well, they've run out of totally non-alcoholic apple juice. And Jesus is like, oh, mom, I didn't even know you were a part of the Assemblies of God. And, Jesus, and she's like, yeah, I am. And that's, that's good. And, and what do you want me to do? And we're like, fix it, fix it. And so, so, so Jesus says, what do you have in your hand? So they've got six clay pots. What can you fill it with? With water. And so they did what they, there was an intention. The intention was we're going to do something to fix the, set, the festival, the celebration. And then the ability, what do you, what do you, what's your ability? Well, I can get a pot. What can you fill it with? I can fill it with water. Is that all you can do? That's all we can do. And then they matched their ability with Jesus' supernatural ability, and the water was changed to totally non-alcoholic apple juice. Moses wanted to build a place of worship for God. God, we need your presence here. We need you to guide us through this time of, of isolation and in the wilderness. And then Moses said, we're going to build a temple, for, a tabernacle for God, a, a, a meeting place. And then he said to the people, what's in your hand? And they went to their house and they brought back what was in their house. And some of them gave gold and some of them gave fabric. It wasn't equal giving, it was equal sacrifice, but they were intentional. And they were able to build a house for God and then God's presence turned up. Malachi chapter 3 talks about bring the tithes into the storehouse. Take a portion of what you have in your hand and bring it into the kingdom of God and invest your ability in with God's ability and then multiply the seed and do all the things that you can do as a congregation. You think about that. You think about it. God. God wants to do something spectacular. Amen. How many people believe God wants to do something spectacular in our generation and, and in our city? and beyond our walls. And so the principle of the tithe is simply this. You grab it, and you, you may not think it's much. It may, may, maybe right now a tithe to you is $10 a week. Maybe it's $50 a week. And you're like, well, what, what, what can God do with $50 a week? Well, God can do a lot with $50 a week. When you invest it into his kingdom, and then you, you connect it with everybody else's ability, and then God breathes on it. It's amazing what we're able to do as the church when everybody collectively comes together with a passion for Jesus and his mission. It's just amazing what we can do together. And you say, well, I, well it doesn't seem like much. Well, God says, no, bring, bring the tithe into the storehouse. And then he says, test me now. This is where God's ability comes in. You've done what you can do. You bought your tithe in. God says, Let, test me. Check out my ability. If I won't open up the floodgates of heaven, you open your wallet a bit, I'll open the floodgates of heaven a lot. That's a really good deal. And God says, and I'll open up for you, I'll pour out for you such a blessing, you can't contain it. Why? God says, I want you to be blessed so you can be a blessing, but to get you blessed to be a blessing, I first need you to bless somebody so I can bless you. If you can bless the church, I can bless you, and then you can be blessed to be a blessing. That's how God works. And so it's not equal, it's not equal giving, but the sacrifice is the same. And it's intentional. But then what God does with it is God says, the, the ability is not the same. I'm going to do in here what you couldn't do on your own. Intentionality begins when you get something in your hand. Jesus said, what have you got in your hand? Whenever we want to see a miracle, whenever we want to see something happen, it always comes back to what do you want to happen and then what's in your hand? Jesus took bread and the fish into his hands. But Jesus got the bread and the fish in his hands by taking it out of their hands. So all they had was some loaves of bread and some fish. They took it out of their hands. Their ability, here you go. Now they give it to Jesus and they marry what their ability was with his ability. And the miracle was a, re a result of Jesus' ability. The miracle was a result of Jesus' ability. Equal intentionality, but different ability. When it left their hands and when it went into his hands, everything changed. It all depends on whose hands it's in. A basketball in my hands is probably only worth the value of the basketball. But a basketball in Steph Curry's hands is worth about $40 million a year. It just depends on whose hands it's in. A, a golf club in my hands is a dangerous object. 
a weapon of slightly mass destruction, and, and it's worth about $200. But a golf club in Tiger Woods' hands, well, that, that's worth about $800 million. It, it all depends on whose hand it's in. A, a tennis racket in my hand is useless. It's not even a good fly swatter because of the holes. Probably valued at what, $15? Something like that. But a, but, a, but a tennis racket in Coco Golf's hand is worth $15 million a year. It all depends on whose hand it's in. A rod in my hand may beat away a stray dog or something like that, but in Moses' hands, it was able to part the Red Sea. A, a, a slingshot in my hand. Now, as a, as a loving caring pastor, and it's a blessing to be a pastor of, of Word of Life. And I love you, and I care for you greatly. But this is what I would suggest, please. Never put a slingshot in my hand. <laughs> None of us are safe. Not even I. So a slingshot in, in my hand is, is, is a kid's story. It's a danger. But, but, but in David's hand, it's a mighty weapon. So it's not what it is, it's whose hand it is in that makes all the difference. So, so seven loaves of bread and a few fish in the hands of the disciples, well, what's that? Well, that's just, that's just a few fish sandwiches. It's really not a lot. It may, may, may feed a, a, a couple of people. Some of you, it may be just one meal. But when the, when the fish and the bread get into the hands of Jesus, everything changes. Everything changes when it gets into his hands. It's not what it is. It depends on whose hands it gets into. They did not have the ability to feed the large crowd. That was not their ability, but their action displayed their intention. We can't do it. We don't have the ability to do it, but this is what we've got, Jesus, and we want to give it to you. It displayed their intention. Like, we don't know how it's going to happen, but we know you've done it before, and we're asking you to do it again, so we're taking what's in our hands, and we're giving it to you. I suppose the advancement for the disciples from the feeding of the 5,000 to the 4,000 was that the 5,000, they didn't even have anything in their hands. They had to use their hands to mug a kid to get his meal out of his hands to give it to Jesus. Now, at least they were smart enough to bring it up on the mountain with them. They had something in their hands. And their intentionality was displayed through their willingness to give it all. It wasn't much. It's not a lot. Seems like it lacks, but we're going to give it all. Their ability is what? Seven loaves, a few fish, we're having lunch, just a couple of us. But seven loaves and a few fish with Jesus' ability meant that it was a banquet for a multitude. When they, when they put what was in their hand into Jesus' hand, everything changed. But it didn't change until it left their hand. Something has to leave your hand. That's a sacrifice. As long as you've got a hold of it, nothing's going to happen. But as soon as you can let go of it, you, you, cannot, you cannot reap unless you sow. So you take what's in your hand, you take seeds, you let them release out of your hand into the ground, and then you trust God that he's going to put his ability to what he put in the seed, and it's going to grow. But unless you sow, it won't grow. And so you've got to sow before you can reap. Intentionality also requires that you and I get in alignment. It says, and having given thanks. The very first thing Jesus did when he got it into his hands, he gave thanks. We've got to be people that keep coming into the presence of God and be people of joy, be people of gratitude, be people of thanks, and keep asking God, God, what do you want me to do? 
We're going to keep walking into his presence and say, God, what do you want us to do? Who do you want us to be? How can we change our world? God, we need you to align us with your purposes and your plans. My, my ability is limited, but God is limitless. I don't want to limit my life by the things that I'm not capable of doing. I want, to, I want to take off the limits by putting my plan into God's plan and making His plan my plan. I, I, I want to take the limitations off my life by saying, God, use me like only you can use me. Is there anybody in the house that's like that? Say, God, I, I, I want to be used by, I want to be used by you, God. I want to take off the limiters on my own life and just go as fast as I can and as big as I can and as impacting as I can. God, I want to change the world around me. But we look at our ability and we always get overwhelmed. Like, God, I, I, I can barely change the sheet on my bed. You want me to change the world? God says, yeah. What do you got in your hand? Let, 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 let's align our lives. Intentionality requires anticipation. So he took it, he blessed it, and he broke it. When he broke it, that's a mindset that this thing is going to go way beyond where we're at at the moment. That, I, that I'm preparing to give this away. And, and as a church, we need to have that mindset. We need to have the mindset that, that, that as limiting as what everything looks like, what we've got, we're preparing ourselves for maximum impact. When Jesus breaks the bread, he, he does that in not just like, I'm, I'm going to break it and give it to the disciples. No, he's like, I, I'm going I'm to break it and I'm going to give it to the disciples and then I want you guys to go out and I want you to break it and I want you to give it away. And what did it say? He was unwilling to let them go away hungry. So his intention here, matched with his ability, <clears throat> is if you'll just do what you are doing, if you, have, if you disciples will have a mindset of keeping breaking the bread and giving it away, multiplying, we can have a miracle. But you have to be intentional in your expectation that God can do and will do miracles. We have to, we have to get ourselves to a point in the kingdom of, of God where we, where we believe that not only does God could use us, but he wants to use us to change the world and have an impact on the need that is in the world around us. Proverbs is clear, says there's one who, who gives yet increases more. There's one who withholds more than it is right and it leads to poverty. There's, there's, there's a principle of releasing it and letting it go. So he took it out of their hand. Now it's in Jesus' hands. And then he blessed it. God, what do you want me to do? And then he broke it. We, we have to get, as the church, Word of Life Church, we have to get our, our head around God wanting us to, to impact the need in the world around us. Now, if you're online a little bit, social media anywhere, the mega church, the large church, is bad-mouthed quite often. People have a, like a nasty taste in their mouth about the mega church, large churches. So people don't want to be a part of a mega church. They want to be a part of a small, a big push for like small, small churches, 15, 20 people. This is the church. This is how they did it. But I, I would suggest to you that while that thinking is, is fine, you've got, it's an opinion, it really is small thinking. And I would encourage you, don't reduce your faith to the lowest common denominator of somebody else's expectation. That sort of thinking is a person who gets the loaf of bread and says, well, we just got to keep this loaf of bread. We're going to hold this loaf of bread. It's all about me and my and my thing and how comfortable I feel. I got my nice loaf of bread. Let me lick the bread. I don't want it to go too fast. And you're like, no, break it and give it away. See, church has to be more than Sunday. Now, I love Sunday. I, I love coming here. I love hanging out with you on Sunday. I, I love our praise and worship. I think our band, maybe we should give it up for our band. They do an amazing job, our, our team and... And all the things that happen in, in church on Sunday, the lighting, the seats, everything that happens, the, the screens, all that. I love all that. Why? Because I just like it. 
It's like, do you, think, do you think unsaved people come in and they look at that and they get saved? No. Are you doing it for the unsaved people? No. Why are you doing it? Because it just looks cool. Can't we just enjoy things? You, you, you buy clothes and wear clothes you like. Some of you teenagers that are here, you're wearing clothes that your, your parents would never buy for you. And your parents look at you and they go, what are you wearing? But your parents buy your clothes, you're like, ah, I'm not wearing that. Like, why not? Because it's not, you don't like it, so you don't wear it. You don't wear the clothes you don't like. We wear, we wear clothes we like, generally. That's like, so I want to be in church that I like, and, I, and, and, and that's enjoyable. And I think we should be able to do that as a church. We should be able to enjoy ourselves on Sunday. But while I enjoy it, and this is awesome, this is not it. This is where we mobilize the troops. This is where we get in alignment together. When we go out of here, the church becomes the church. When we go out into the workplace, when we go out into our school, when we go out into our neighborhood, when we go out into our families, we get out of the building and we mobilize the church to what we can do. Now, in a church, we can have a group of 15. We call that a life group. You can have the church, small church experience every week if you're in a life group. We have life groups in there where we gather. I have my own life group. We gather together on a Wednesday night. We hang out. There's about eight guys that hang out together. There's other groups like that around. That, that's church right there. We're having fellowship. Something goes wrong. We had one guy in our life group just a couple of weeks ago. His boy went to hospital. And everybody in our life group was reaching out, seeing what we could do to help the family. Because that's a church. But I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to be honest with you. We're not a mega church yet. We're barely a large church. But I, 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 and I don't know, we got, only God can do what God can do. But if we ever become a mega church, if we ever become a church of thousands of people, and I have a dream that one day this building will be filled up multiple times on a Sunday, it's not so we will have a name for ourselves. It's not so I, I t- t- listen, I feel good about me now. I'm really comfortable in my own skin now. You may have gathered that. So, so when I came here, we're probably... We're only, I think, on a Sunday, one service, probably half of what's in this room right now. On one service on a Sunday when we got here, about half what's in this room right now, maybe, maybe even less. And I felt good about me and my wife, Anna. I was happy with me. And I don't feel any better about myself today. This is, a church growing should not change me. What it does is it changes our ability. You think about this. Let's say there's a thousand something people on campus today. They're about, it's pretty close, let's call it a thousand. We all give in $10 each. We can have a $10,000 impact. If if we give 10 loaves of bread each, we can give out 10,000 loaves of bread, just just because of the number. If we're a church of 10,000 and you give the same $10, now we're talking 100,000. Now we're talking about 100,000 loaves of bread. And you can impact that many more people. The only benefit for a really large church is the impact you can have Monday to Saturday. That's that's God's design of the large church. The large church is not supposed to be large so we can just consume all this on ourselves and pat ourselves on the back or whatever. No, it's so we can have impact. So we want to see souls saved. We want to see lives turned around. If we're believing for people to get saved and we want to depopulate hell and populate heaven, the church has just got to grow. You don't sound that convinced. You're either not convinced or you're not interested, and the second one's really bad. So I'd rather you be not convinced. We're going to grow. Intentionality requires action. It just requires that there is action. He gave them to the disciples, and then the disciples gave them to the crowds. So he gave them, Jesus said, the miracle's in my hand, but I'm going to need you to outwork the miracle. And this is the same today. You've got to be prepared, not just to give what's in your hand, but to give what God puts into your hand. To use your talents, gifts, and abilities, opportunity. Give it away. Multiplication. And there's no multiplication until you give it away. There's no multiplication until you give away a smile. There's no multiplication until you give away a text message saying, I'm praying for you. There's no, there's no giving away until you tell somebody at work, I appreciate you, you're amazing. We don't do this enough in the church. 
The church is so busy nitpicking what we don't like about the world around us. We just waste our time. I think God hasn't called us to a ministry of nitpicking. God has called us to a ministry of edifying, building up, finding even the good when bad things are there. Looking beyond the problem and seeing the potential. Looking at what can do, at what can happen. We say, oh, this is a horrible situation. Yeah, it is horrible. It's just seven loaves and a few fish. That's the situation. And there's 4,000 people that need to be fed. But what can God do if we take something from our hands, put it into His hands, align with His uh, plan and possibility and say, come on, God, do something in this generation. There's one who withholds, and the Bible says it leads to poverty. The one who gives it away. Ah, let's, let's get that give it away mentality in our, in our, in our mind as, as the church. Oh God, what can I give away? The result is the economics of sacrifice. That it's not equal ability, but it's equal intentionality. We don't all have the same ability, but we can all have the same intentionality. We don't have the same ability as Jesus, but we can all have the same intentionality. Every one of us in this room today can say, God, I I wanna be the church. I don't wanna attend church. I wanna be the church. I don't wanna just come and sit in a seat, and we love it when you come and worship and hang out and we get to hang out together. I love that. I love the fact that we come together, all these different languages and cultures and demographics, and it's awesome. I, I love the picture that we have of our church. I love the fact that some people drive through here and, and they see the nativity scene as they drive through the, 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 the doorway there. And I, and I love the fact that we have somebody else in our church who could drive through the doorway three times and not even see the nativity. But he's going to go there one day and say, what? We, when do we get that nativity scene out there? And he's going to be all excited. It, it, it takes all sorts to make up the church. <laughs> but verse 37, look at this. And they all ate and were satisfied. They all ate. What did Jesus say? I'm unwilling to let them go without a miracle. And then they took what was in their hands, put it in his hands. He put it back in their hands. They distributed. And they all ate and they were satisfied. And then Jesus said, clean up the mess. And they took up seven baskets full of of broken pieces that were left over. Seven basketfuls. This is a different basket. The, the, the wording is different than the one that we use in the feeding of the 5,000. This is a bigger basket. Seven basketfuls. Partnership. If we can just match our intentionality and our ability with Jesus, we're going to get miracles. We're going to get miracles. And the miracles are not answered by the, the need. The, the miracles are answered by our desire to invest. And what's left over is always more than what was there in the first place. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it was written, he has freely distributed to the poor. He has freely distributed, sorry, and has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower, he who supplies seed to the sower, and bread for the food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing. You see the partnership? And increase the harvest of your righteousness. Is there anybody in the house that says, God, I want you to increase the, the harvest of my righteousness. I want you to increase what I'm doing. I, I want you to increase my effort. I want you to increase my ability. I want you to increase my impact. You'll be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. The economics of sacrifice is not equal ability, it's equal intentionality. When Jesus was about to make the biggest sacrifice, Russell, you guys can come. Uh, He gathered the disciples together. He'd set his face towards Jerusalem. He knew he was going to the cross. And then he got the disciples together. And pretty much he was saying, I want you to do this and remember what's happening. I never want you to forget the sacrifice. I I, I never want you to forget that I told you to pick up your cross and follow me. And so this is how it's going to work. He took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it. He took bread, they gave him bread. He 
He took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it away. He took bread. What do we got in the room? We have some bread. Pass me the bread. That was their ability. Then he gave thanks. Father, not my will, but your will be done. That's what he said in the garden. But this is what he's saying here. God, I'm, I'm coming into alignment for your plan for my sacrifice. That he broke it. Lord, this is, I'm giving my, my blood and my body for the remission of sins from everybody, for many. What's going to happen here in this communion, in the sacrifice of the cross, is going to impact generations for generations. And then he gave it to them. We are, we're launching CityServe today. We have a desire to impact the, the, the region. We've been really good as a church with missions. And we'll continue to do that. We have, we have no desire to pull back. In fact, I think next year we're doing close to fifty dollars or $60,000 more next year than we anticipated doing this year. So we're not pulling back off missions. In fact, we've, 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 we've started a couple of new missions projects next year. But, but we, don't want to be, we don't want to be missing Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and then just go into the other most parts of the earth. We want to start where we're supposed to start, which is our own hometown, the DMV. And so we want, we want to get Word of Life Church into a, into a local mission, changing our world, one person at a time mindset. I, I, I want our church to be, be aware of the need in our own community. Uh, City, City Serve is what we've partnered with. It's an organization based out of Bakersfield, California. It was started by Dave Donaldson, who used to attend here. In fact, Dave was here just a couple of weeks ago in church. And, and what we do is we, we, will, we will get a tra- truckload that's been donated uh, as goods in kind. They do it as a tax write-off from Amazon, Costco, Pottery Barn. The load we have in right now is from Amazon. And so we, we, we got a load in, a semi in. We've unloaded that, we've inventoried it. It's been a bit of a, bit of a learning curve. This is a, this is a learning curve for us to get this happening. And we've inventoried it and we have an app. It's called the Hero app. When you go out today, you'll get one of these forms. And we'd love you to, to get a hold of this and scan the barcode and maybe engage in getting trained in how to use the Hero app. It takes about two hours to, uh, to engage in using uh, the Hero app. And so we're not doing that today. And so you'll get the app and then you would go onto it. Maybe you have a, a, a neighbor that's just moved into the community and they have a need and you scan through. Uh, one of the ladies in our church, she was scanning through and she had a little girl that had autism and she saw in the in the stock that we had a board that she could ride on. And she said, I want that board. And then, then there was a pillow and then there was a walker, like a wheelchair that we got given a wheelchair. And so she saw the wheelchair and she knew somebody that needed a wheelchair, an elderly person that needed. And she said, I'll take the wheelchair. And so you just mark those down on the app and then we'll get the supply, bring it on a Sunday. You just pick it up and then you just take it and you just give it away. We just want to put something in your hand. We want, we want to get something in your hand so you've got something that you can go and give it away and put it into the Jesus' hand and let Him multiply it. And so we'll train you on how to, to use the, 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 the app, but that's not our goal today. What we did today was we, we removed the app just for today. And so in the, the gym out here, we have tables that we've just bought stock from our warehouse. And so we have all sorts of things. We have pillows. We have we have umbrellas out there. We have electronics, all sorts of things. We also asked some of our team to get bread. So we have bread out there. We have some food items out there as, as well. Uh, that's not normally a part of City Serve. We just want to be able to do that today. And so everybody here can get something in their hand. We want you to go out there today. We want you to look around. We want you to pray, God, who in my world has need? Maybe, maybe in your, your world, you have somebody and who's in need of looking like Mary Poppins. I'm not, yeah? Chim Chimney? Is that the same movie? Yes. Oh, got me. Feeling pretty good. But, 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 but just say you, you saw a neighbor this week when it was raining and they were running out into their vehicle and they just got soaked 
and they're running out to catch a bus to go to work and they got so they don't have an umbrella. They're the sort of things that we're saying, ask God. May, may, I think we've got a few umbrellas out there. Maybe you're like, you know what? I, I, I drive past a, a daycare where low-income families and I, the people trying to get, may, maybe they could do with five umbrellas. And so you just get the umbrellas and you just go to the daycare and you say, hey, I, I notice you all getting soaked in the rain. Could, could you use some umbrellas? Hey, just give them away. And they may go, no. Well, then I pray and ask God to give somebody else. But it's amazing. One of the stories that Dave Donaldson tells is that their organization was given five boats, like, like rowboats. And they took up a lot of room in their warehouse. And so the team were like, can we get rid of the boats? They're, who's going to want a boat? And, and Dave said, let's keep them. And so they kept them. And about three weeks later, Katrina hit. And they needed people rescued in boats. And so they were able just to give all the boats away to the people that were needing to go out and help, help get people. So, that, so there's a God factor in that. And so what we're asking today is, let, let's start. Let's, let's, let's get on the Hope app. Let's get trained up. We'll get the resource in. We have the warehouse. Maybe you could volunteer, uh, volunteer on the team to help us load the warehouse. Maybe you've got the skills to help us get an accurate inventory in the warehouse and organizational skills in the warehouse. Uh, there was a group of uh, eight of us last night just packing up uh, from the warehouse into the box truck and bringing it down here and unloading. Maybe you could do that. Everyone can be involved, but we want you to get something in your hand. Maybe it's a loaf of bread today and say, God, who do I have in my life that would appreciate a loaf of bread or some veggies? or whatever else is out there. Go and check it out after service. Get something in your hand. Let's be a church that meets need. They say, what happens when I give it away? Then just pray that God will bless it. Pray that God will multiply it. Say, what are you praying? That God will give them more umbrellas? No. I'm praying that God will multiply that you meet a need and those people are like, why did you do that? I only do that because God loves me and our church loves our community. And who knows, maybe one day that person will come here. We're not giving it with strings attached. You don't have to attend here to get this. We're just giving it to you because we want to bless you. But who knows? Who knows? Maybe, maybe, the, maybe the need is multiplied when they go, I want, I want to go to that church. And they come here, they get saved. And then all of a sudden they're on the Hope app and now they're getting supplies and they're giving it away to somebody. Who says, why are you giving it away? And they say, well, I'm part of Word of Life Church. What's that? And you tell them, you bring it, and they come and they get saved and then they get on the Hope app and then they go and get something and then they go and give it away. And when you multiply it out like that, we have the potential to feed the thousands with our seven loaves and a few feet. If we just take it, bless it, break it, and give it away. Father, we just pray that you would overshadow us today. Let your presence be on us in a significant way right now in this moment. Even in this moment, God, I pray, God, that you would, you would start to speak to us about need. Start to speak to us about need. Who in our life could we bless by just giving something away? Lay people on our heart. Maybe in this room today, Put people on their heart that they've never thought about for years. Put a burden about a neighbor or about a ministry. Maybe, maybe this week they drove past that unhoused person on the side of the road asking for help. Maybe today they could find a nice blanket or pillows or something that could be help. And they could take that and they could go and give it away. Maybe they live near a shelter for battered women. And they could take something and bless the shelter. Maybe, maybe there's a single parent that's struggling. They could find Christmas presents, maybe. Lord, just lay it on our heart. You are unwilling to let the, the need go by. And so God, I pray that you'd make us unwilling to let the need go without being fulfilled. But those online, those watching this, Lord God, knit our hearts together to fulfill needs in the world around us. That's our prayer. 
Thank you so much for joining Word of Life Church online today. Our prayer is that your faith was strengthened and you were inspired. We would love for you to be a regular part of our online family. The best way to do so is by clicking that like button, hitting subscribe, and ringing that bell so you don't miss out on any life-changing content. If you have more time today, go ahead and click another one of our videos right here. If not, we love you. We can't wait to see you online again soon. God bless.